ओके सो गुड मॉर्निंग मैडम प्रोफेसर मिश्रा सर माई कलीग डॉक्टर साकिब एंड डियर लर्नर yesterday we discuss about the consolidation of british and today we discussing on uh, the consolidation of british rule and its uh, indian responses so it's a very interesting topic and uh, apart from interesting uh, madam explaining every topic in a very detailed uh, way the ppt and map uh, help us lot for better understanding uh, so thank you so much madam for uh, taking all this effort and uh, let me tell you the little introduction of this uh, topic so today we are going to discuss uh, about uh, the topics like first is uh, our peasant and uh, tribal resistance against the british rule the sanyasi rebellion of 1763 the kond rebellion in bhumsur and next the santal rebellion and in next in unit 5 we will discuss about the revolt of 1857 and its nature and significance and then in unit 6 we discussing uh, the land revenue settlement that is permanent settlement revenue settlement and mahalwari uh, settlement so uh, uh, so let me tell uh, the sanyasi rebellion that is uh, the sanyasi uh, revolt also known as and uh, the activities of sanyasi and fakir in bengal against the east india company rule in the late 18th century and it is also known as the sanyasi rebellion which took place uh, around uh, murshidabad and uh, by kuntupur forest of uh, jalpaiguri then uh, next is about the kond rebellion the kond rebellion of uh, bhumsur where uh, the bhanja in 1835 became the immediate cause of the rebellion and after his death the brundaban bhanja and uh, jagannath bhanja the two members of the royal family became rebellious and uh, got the supported by dora bisoi the tribal chief of the kons of ghumsur and uh, ghumsur is in the area of uh, odisha then we will see about the santhal rebellion so uh, what is the santhal rebellion santhal rebellion which was carried uh, by agricultural people Uh, those are santhal in 1855 in rajmahal hills in bihar and the santhal rebellion also turned into an in anti british and in the next unit that is 1857 revolt of the nature and significance this indian rebellion of 1857 was a major but ultimately it was also unsuccessful it was a uprising in india took place from 1857 to 58 against the rule of the british east india company then in the uh, unit 6 we will discussing about the permanent settlement uh, permanent settlement of bengal generally was uh, brought into effect by the east india company which was headed by governor general lord uh, conwallis in 1793 and this was an agreement between the company and the zamidars to fix the land revenue then in the uh, rewatwari what we see that uh, in 1820 it was uh, carried on by Th- thomas munro and he was the governor of madras in 1820 and it was practiced in uh, B- madras and bombay areas as well as uh, assam and kurg provinces and in this system the peasant and cultivators were regarded as the owners of the land and uh, lastly about the mahalwari which was introduced by the halt mckenzie in 1822 and uh, it was uh, mainly covered the state of punjab awadh agra and parts of odisha and madhya pradesh so now i am requesting uh, ms tripti dev ma'am to please start the class thank you sure. thank you dr shaheen for a brief of all the topics that we will be covering today good morning everyone and thank you all for joining us today now um, yesterday I, if you remember we had covered i've covered i had covered a couple of topics which were really quite related to what we'll be looking at today we looked at uh, the 
eastern coast of India, where we, where we saw that how gradually Bengal was taken over gradually by uh, the Britishers, and how on the east, on the western coast, the regions of Maharashtra, Maratha, and also how Mysore was gradually taken by taken over by the Britishers. So uh, we are now kind of familiar with these regions, I'm sure. Uh, now we will be moving today uh, to further. Uh, uh, a further uh, discussion on some other aspects of this period that we will be uh, looking at. Uh, there, there are going to be land revenue settlement that we will be looking at. We will also be looking at, uh, 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 let me just go to my slide first and then um, begin with my discussion straight from um, the slide. Yeah. So uh, I think my slide is quite visible now to all of you. So um, what we are going to be really discussing today is the consolidation part of the British rule and Indian response to it. Yesterday, uh, we talked about the British rule and British rule. How did the British rule come? How did they take a foundation? And how did they do Subsidiary alliance, doctrine of lapse. It's say on different regions to India ke hai, us, us may expand here, annex kya on regions ko apne under control me liya hai. Ab ye sab kam karne ke baad, now how are the Britishers really consolidating their rule? Consolidation means that how are they really establishing solidly their rule? Apne aap ja, waha ja ke uh, Britishers ne. Uh, attack to kar liya, annex to kar liya, but us regions ko mazboot tarikay se consolidate karna ki waha pe wo sahi tarikay se rule kar, pa, kar paaye jisse ki Britishers uh, benefit kar sake commercially uh, us region se isi liye Britishers ko waha consolidate karne ki zorat padi pure Indian subcontinent pe jaha jaha Britishers ka rule tha so consolidation of British rule and the Indian responses. Of course, the Britishers consolidate kar rahe hai, to, uh, uh, it is at the cost of different uh, sectors, at, at the cost of different communities of India. Peasants be affect ho rahe, artisans be affect ho rahe, industrialists be affect ho rahe, farmers be affect ho rahe, um, uh, uh, middle class be affect ho rahe. So what are the how, ye Indians jo hai, different categories, ke, how are they responding to? And reacting to the consolidation of the British rule. So we will be looking at um, uh, the block two of the uh, GEHI 02 e-learning course that you have and I think most of our second semester students, honors be honest, GE students will be joining us today. Now the broad themes uh, are three broad themes, broad themes that we will be covering today. First being the peasant and tribal resistance against the British rule. I think I have taken some classes in the past few months, so I have talked about how peasants and tribals are different when the Britishers are expanding and making colonial forest policies. So I have talked about this in detail in the past few months when I was talking about colonial forest policy. So there will be some overlaps because the details are the same. So please bear with the repetition. So um, peasants and tribal resistance. So tribals, how they resist kar rahe hai, is particular rebellion, karke, attacks, karke. Kya uh, unki modes the uh, resistances ke? So we will talk this particular topic. Mein baat Particularly, we have Sanyasi Rebellion, which was in 1763, Kond Rebellion in Gumsur, and Santal Rebellion. These are three rebellions that we will specifically look at. Of course, we can't see peasant or tribal resistances, we can't study kar sakte because we have limited time. But we will be looking at these three particular uh, uh, peasant and tribal resistances. After that, I will be taking you through the Khand rebellion, uh, the revolt of 1857. Revolt of 1857, when you talk about it, all of us are familiar with what was this revolt of 1857, what triggered this revolt of 1857. But um, what we will be really looking at is the nature and the significance of the revolt. We uh, it will take a lot of time if we discuss the revolt in great detail, but I'll spend at least 15 minutes on discussing the revolt. Kyu hua? Kya iske consequences? The kya iska nature tha? Kya course tha? Kya kon kon si sectors or uh, groups jo hai is isme participation kia? Kinhone nahi kia? So there are a lot of aspects to what uh, to the study of revolt of 1857. Uh, we will also study um, briefly about the various land revenue settlement. So, we uh, all know that the maximum revenue at that point of time, which was from agriculture. 
लैंड रेवेन्यू अब लैंड रेवेन्यू को बढ़ाने के लिए मैक्सिमाइज करने के लिए द ब्रिटिश गवर्नमेंट रियलाइज दैट इट हैड टू ले डाउन सर्टन सेटलमेंट सिस्टम दैट मींस नए मेथड्स को अप्लाई करना पड़ेगा लगाना पड़ेगा इन लैंड पे जिससे क्या रेवेन्यू को मैक्सिम मैक्सिमम तरीके से ब्रिटिशर्स ले सके उसको एग्जैक्ट कर सके राइट सो ऑफ कोर्स ये भी एक दिमाग चीज में रख, दिमाग में रखनी है चीज कि इंडिया इज अ वेरी डाइवर्स जोग्राफिकली वेरी डाइवर्स रीजन सो एक एक सेटलमेंट सिस्टम एक लैंड रेवेन्यू सेटलमेंट सिस्टम कैन नॉट बी कैन नॉट वर्क फॉर ऑल दर ऑल दर ऑल द अदर रीजन ऑल द रीजन ऑफ इंडिया सो डिफरेंट डिफरेंट रेवेन्यू सेटलमेंट सिस्टम डिवाइस लाइक परमानेंट सेटलमेंट सिस्टम फॉर बेंगाल रोयतवारी एंड महलवारी सिस्टम फॉर अदर रीजन मेड्रास बॉम्बे सो वी विल लुक एट दीज एस्पेक्ट ऑल्सो ड्यूरिंग द कोर्स ऑफ आर लेक्चर so let me begin discussing the first topic which is the tribal the peasant and tribal resistance against british rule so mai aapko pehle hi batana chahungi ki abhi aapko dimag mein jo map rakhna hai map of india pura rakhna hai we not looking specifically at bengal or north india or um, the uh, or bombay or madras or you know the central india we are looking at india all together All right so what you should really bear in your mind is the entire map of india and map of india where the colonial rule is now firmly established now they are only trying to consolidate understand indians understand the indian community understand the different geographical aspects of india the culture the tradition of india the britishers are now interested in this because jitna wo indians ko janenge utna wo better rule kar payenge right so uh, now britishers are really getting into the real aspects of rule colonial rule in indian uh, system right so uh, let's look at the causes and character uh, generally kya uh, causes the peasant or tribal resistance resistance matlab ki aap aap uh, um, uh, resistance means that you are resisting the colonial rule the tribals are uh, against the colonial rule they are they are revolting against the colonial rule right so uh, the first point that in my slide is that the protest against mughal administration was also so let's not think that the peasants and tribal were only revolting or resisting against a, a, a british rule for the first time that means that even when the even before when even before the britishers came to india when there was mughal rule in india at that point of time also peasants and tribal resistance was there peasants and tribals would always resist and oppose any kind of exploitative rule now that exploitative rule exploitative means ki jo un un unke system ko hila rahi hai peasants aur tribals ke system mein interfere kar rahi hai jo bhi koi bhi system ya koi bhi rule unke system mein unko exploit karega wo uske against awaaz uthayenge to mughal ke samay pe bhi mughal rule jab chal raha tha mughal administration ke against bhi peasants aur tribals us us daur us us daur mein unhone bhi resistance kiya tha unhone bhi awaaz uthayi thi right but because our topic of discussion is under the british rule we will be talking about the tribal and peasant resistance against the british rule in specific hmm? so protest against mughal administration was not uncommon in pre colonial india right so ek ek baat hame hamesha dhyan rakhni chahiye that not everything started with the british rule there were resistances there were there were um, uh, there were continuities in in the way people functioned uh, from before the british rule of right so uh, establishment of colonial rule what it did was colonial rule is a british rule that i'm talking about here the establishment of colonial rule had devastating effects and devastating effects of its policies had lasting impact which forced peasants to revolt जो तरीके थे पेजेंट्स को एक्सप्लॉयट करने के वो अलग थे और वो ज्यादा बदतर होते गए दे बिकेम इवन मोर अट्रोशियस ऑन द पेजेंट्स वेन द कलोनियल रूल के सो इट हैड डेवास्टेटिंग इफेक्ट जो इफेक्ट था पॉलिसीज के ब्रिटिशर्स ने जो पॉलिसीज बनाई थी दे हैड अ लास्टिंग इम्पैक्ट ऑन द पेजेंट्स एंड दैट फोर्स टेम टू रिवोल्ट इन द रियल सेंस For example, the harsh land revenue demand 
corrupt practices, harsh attitude of tax collecting officials provoked peasants to rise in revolt. Right. So um, uh, uh, tax collection was happening before also, before uh, the Britishers came to India. Tax collection was always being taken from the peasants. But the attitude became harsher and stricter and inhuman with the colonial rule. Corrupt practices were also there before also, but now they became even worse that the peasants had to leave their land or the peasants had to force to sell their land and were forced to sell their land. The land revenue demand was there before also, but it became harsher. It became unbelievable, unreasonable. The peasants were, um, their land was uh, under famine and drought. And despite that, they had to pay taxes, which were probably waived before under the, under the Mughal rule. Right. So uh, uh, let's understand that the intensity of exploitation of the peasants was at another level during the British rule. The heavy burden of new taxes, rigidity of tax collection, even in drought years, rack renting of peasants, had they all had devastating effect on tribal economy. All right. So I'm taking the peasants and tribal resistances kind of uh, together, and there may be some general points that I'll be discussing. But yes, uh, from your e-learning resources, you can specifically look at the effect that peasants and the resistance that peasants are having uh, are doing, and what uh, in specific the tribals are resisting for. So uh, uh, the growth of intermediaries, my second point in the slide, the great growth of intermediaries, uh, money lenders, revenue collectors exploited the presence. So uh, we will see that during the British, uh, British time, there, there was an immense growth of these intermediary class to the lal hai, money lenders and revenue collectors and ye jo beach mein jo present or state ke beach mein jo bahut sare groups aate hai, ha, jo, uh, those were growing in number. And they were creating major problems for the peasantry because they were they were acting in illegal ways of exploiting the peasantry. So uh, expansion of British revenue administration over tribal territories leading to loss of ownership of land by the tribals. Um, a very important thing that Britishers did was they wanted to maximize the revenue. So what they did was they were actually bringing more land under cultivation. And this cultivation, they were when they were trying to bring more land under cultivation uh, to get more revenue from that land, they they and they were entering tribal land, and they were also encroaching on that tribal land and trying to settle the people there and um, uh, make them cultivators, force them to become cultivators. You know that was against their social systems, their economic system, and gradually the tribals lost the ownership of their land also. So you can imagine that how uh, gradually the territories, the tribals, ke apne areas hain, unpe, un, unpe kaise Britishers havi ho rahe the, aur kaise unko uh, tribals apna land jo hai, they eventually lost to the Britishers. British law jo hai, British forest policies jo hai, uski jo judiciary hai, it did not aid peasantry or tribals. Rather, it safeguarded the interest of exploitating class. And when I'm saying exploitating class here, I mean these intermediaries, these zamindars, these money lenders, these revenue collectors, the state itself. So these people were getting strengthened. In Kocho hai himat milri thi. Or jo pis rahe the, wo the peasants or tribals. So there was also destruction of the indigenous industry, which led to large scale migration. The indigenous industries, hai, apne craft industries, hai, pottery industries, and a lot of shilp kala or these industries, the cotton industry, the handloom industry, they were these uh, people in this category, ke logo ko, jo in, in occupations, mein the, they were literally destroyed. And they largely moved, jo in, in pas employment nahi thi, they moved to agricultural and industrial uh, factories. So there was further stress on the agricultural land. All right, they, the pressure on agriculture further increased. Yes, so most of these rebellions, which the peasants ne or tribals ne kiya, because unko ye parishaniya thi, or Britishers unke regions, unke area, unke subsistence pe, they were they were they were pressing on their, in fact, on their livelihood. Uh, all of these rebellions that the peasants and tribals did, they were generally very highly localized. 
अपने रीजन में ही वो प्रेजेंस और ट्राइबल रेजिस्टेंसेज हो रहे थे एंड दे वर क्वाइट आइसोलेटेड इंसिडेंट्स they did not really gain uh, national importance and i i think again uh, in my previous lectures in the last month i have discussed that how the localized peasant and tribal issue was not a national issue the congress did not make that as a national issue then right in fact most of the parties did not make so the peasants and tribals were independently res resisting and reacting to the british rule right so they drew strength kahan se unko strength mili from ethnic or religious ties jo unke clan ties the unke community ties the unke religious ties jo the ha um wahan se in peasants or tribals ko strength mili the technical superiority of british armed forces and law and order machinery ensured british success of course britishers were more technically sound they had a um, huge army jo jisse wo tribals or peasants ko repress kar sakte the unko shant kar sakte the forcefully brutally shant bhi kar sakte the right aur unki jo law and order hai bahut hi smartly britishers ne aise laws banaye jo jis uh, usko justify kiya under rule of law जिससे कि प्रेजेंस और ट्राइबल सफर कर रहे थे राइट सो ऑल ऑफ दिस इंश्योर ब्रिटिश सक्सेस एंड दी डीजनरेशन एंड डिक्लाइन एंड डिवास्टेटिंग इफेक्ट ऑन द प्रेजेंस एंड ट्राइबल्स ऑफ इंडिया सो डिस्पाइट नॉट क्रिएटिंग ह्यूज इम्पैक्ट द प्रेजेंस एंड ट्राइबल रेजिस्टेंसेज वर मार्कर्स ऑफ द फर्स्ट एक्सप्रेशन ऑफ प्रोटेस्ट so these movements were significantly important you know they were highly significant for us because even though unka impact bahut localized tha bahut isolated tha apne regions mein hi sthit tha simit tha they could not really create impact at the, from uh, uh, at the national level but they were highly significant they were highly significant we see that how later gandhi uh, uh, and his mass movement did embrace peasants and tribals in their in his movement you know against the britishers in the national movement right now let's briefly look at the three rebellions that we will be focusing on today uh, i'll i'll be very brief there are details especially on the pond rebellion there are about four pages of discussion um, in in your e learning material so please uh, look at it I don't go into too much detail because it may get a little confusing read it about four or five times and get the sense of analysis of the of the of the rebellion of of the description of the rebellion now look at the let's look at the sanyasi rebellion which happened in about late 18th century now these rebellions of sanyasis and fakirs was against the east india company in bengal traditionally these wandering people exacted religious taxes from villages all right uh, east india administration what it did was uh, it tried to stop the payment of money so sanyasis and fakirs were doing many things they were into many multiple occupations but unka primary jo revenue aata tha in sanyasis fakirs ka wo uh, jo they were wandering tribes um, they were sorry they were wandering people and uh, ye uh, religious jise koi pilgrimage pe ja raha hai to religious tax उनके नाम उनको दिया जाता था द पिलग्रिम्स वुड गिव देम सम अमाउंट ऑफ मनी एज टैक्स व्हेन दे आर गोइंग टू फॉर देयर पिलग्रिमेज सो दैट्स हाउ दे स्टार्टेड दे दे वर डिपेंडेंट ऑन रिलीजियस टैक्सेस फ्रॉम डिफरेंट विलेजेस द सन्यासीज एंड फकीर्स सो व्हाट ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी डिड वाज इट स्टॉप द पेमेंट ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी को लग रहा था कि ये पैसा अननेसेसरी सन्यासीज और फकीर्स ले रहे हैं ये रेवेन्यू तो हमारे पास आना चाहिए so therefore the east india company now started to uh, stop the payment of this money and this would of course anger the sanyasis and fakirs right so this was one of the major reasons for the conflict of sanyasis and fakirs uh, with the east india company and there's a lot of other detail that you can look at but one significant point that you should remember is that uh, in both sanyasis and fakirs uh, 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 rebellion uh, there was equal participation of hindus and muslims leaders like manju shah musa shah bhavani pathak devi chaudhrauni chaudhrauni so these were the important figures in the sanyasi and fakir rebellion in the late 18th century bengal 
Now, Cohn's Rebellion, which uh, was uh, again a mid 19th century phenomenon, 1835 to 36. Now, uh, and you will see that our state, um, uh, Orissa, uh, uh, was uh, the seat of Cohn's Rebellion. Uh, now, this particular region that I'll be talking about was under Madras presidency of the British uh, administration. Okay, specifically the tribals of the Gumsur, Gumsur led by Dora Bisoi. It started the rebellion in Odisha. Uh, activities of Christian missionaries and influence of British tribal religious life um, infuriated Khans and made them rebellious. So uh, we all already know that Odisha uh, as a state was, uh, uh, was a place where the Christian missionaries came in and really expanded and did major conversions to our in, uh, in our in our tribal regions right and um, this was something that the Kond Kond tribe was not very happy and they were infuriated with the way Britishers were entering their spaces and their religious life okay now you have to understand that tribes don't have a, a, a particular so-called main religion they have their own practices which emits uh, which emerges from their local traditions yes so you can't say that the tribes practice hinduism pride tribes practice islam pride tribes practice sikh no the tribes are practicing a customs and traditions which may not be literally called religion per se yes but they're practicing those traditions for a very long time and they are dependent for that practice on many uh, many geographical factors of that the geographical elements in that in their regions. So Kons thought that the Britishers are interfering in their religious life, right? Moreover, the high land revenue demand, the dubious ways of money lenders, caused much hardship to the tribals. Chakra Bisoy, the nephew of Dora Bisoy, later took leadership of the movement. The uprising was extremely violent. And it did momentarily shook the British authority. Yes. So Khan's Rebellion, a very important rebellion that you must look at it and in detail. I, I don't have enough time. So I'm extremely sorry for not being able to discuss these very, very significant rebellions in detail. Now let's move to Santal Rebellion, which um, uh, took place in about 1855. It took place in Bengal presidency. The modern day Jharkhand is what uh, uh, the region is specifically that I'm talking about. There were large number of Santals who settled in Damin e Koh region. Now, if you remember my previous lecture, when I was talking to you about the forest laws uh, that Britishers made, um, when the Britishers were making forest laws, they gradually understood that tribes are a very important part of the Indian, uh, Indian society and economy. And the more they were trying to force the tribes to settle down, do agriculture, it wasn't working for them because there were more and more rebellions. And the tribes were not able to, you know, get into the system of the way Britishers wanted them to settle. So gradually, what uh, in one of the Forest Act, I don't remember exactly which year, the Britishers demarcated a territory, some territories, which would be tribal territories. They were tribal land. All right. So Britishers started doing that. They started making demarcated. They started um, uh, demarcating land where the tribals could stay, do their activities, their functions. You know, in the way that they would like to, you know, do. So these were uh, so uh, in Bengal presidency, the Santhals um, uh, were settled in this um, uh, uh, area demarcated by the Britishers, which was called the Mineko region, and the Britishers promised that they could carry on their land and economic activities. The Santals could carry on their land and uh, economic activities. However, in these regions, the British influence still was there. And the, um, the Santal tribes, they fell prey to usury, corrupt practices of outsiders, zamindars, intermediary collectors, money lenders, right? So the tribals, um, uh, uh, because they have their own system of functioning, um, are people who are very naive to, you know, uh, the the smartness or the, the, the shrewdness of these zamindars, outsiders, intermediary collectors, money lenders. So they very often got into the clutches of, um, uh, uh, they, they fell prey to the, uh, the, um, the, you know, the attractions of doing something in terms of revenue collection. So 
they, they, they were feeling they were falling prey to um, corrupt practices of the outsiders and of course that affected the santals majorly right uh, the leadership assumed uh, in the santal rebellion were by four murmu brothers siddhu kanmu chand and bhairav there's a great discussion on them uh, in your e learning resource please take a look at it these uprisings were quite violent the santal rebellion and they were also brutally repressed by the britishers uh, of course britishers had technically more um, they were more sound to uh, and they were more strong to handle any kind of rebellion so these rebellions um, were quite brutally repressed yes and uh, the descriptions of it again are in many many sources and many uh, uh, secondary writings that have been written on these rebellions now let's go to our discussion of the second particular theme that i have already mentioned the revolt of 1857 its nature and significance so i'm sure all of you have a broad sense of what this revolt of 1857 because uh, you must have studied this in your school textbooks and great amount of discussion work scholarly work is is being done was already done and is still being done um, you know a uh, a uh, 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 on the revolt of 1857 now let's look at broadly what were the causes of this revolt so most of the sepoys found their religious beliefs often in conflict with service conditions like crossing the sea replacement of turban cartridge of enfield rifles which had to be bitten off before loading were greased with pork and beef fat so one of the major uh, category of indians that were um, completely angered because of the uh, the way britishers treated them and functioned with them were the army men the sepoys the soldiers of india right now the soldiers of india the sepoys both from the upper caste or any other caste the middle caste or any other caste they had their own religious beliefs especially sat samundar par karna it was a big thing crossing the sea was a big thing it, crossing the sea for example uh, crossing the sea would mean change of religion change of uh, it would it would amount to uh, uh, for in their belief system it was curseful replacement of turban unki uh, us uh, turban ko replace karne ke liye unko force kiya gaya unki aur unko ek leather um, ek uh, head gear diya gaya this was something that the soldiers did not like cartridge and field rifle mein jo cartridge dalna hai usko uh, they had to bit that off before they loaded it and that was smeared with pork and beef fat so all of these were uh, uh, things that the soldiers were very very unhappy with moreover the meager salaries paid to sepoys racial discrimination in matters of promotion pension etc so there were many many reasons and primarily major reasons because of which the army indians in the army of britishers they revolted they caused they were they were, they were really infuriated angered by the british attitude and they were the first ones to actually rebel there were also many economic causes now we have already discussed many economic causes yesterday also and today also i'm going to uh, in, in in my previous points uh, in the first theme that we discussed uh, there was major loss of employment due to closure of indigenous industries Uh, and when i say indigenous industries i mean the handloom the cotton the textile um the craft industries uh the paintings you know all of these industries um that were uh, that required major skills and there were generations of people who were doing the generations of families um uh, who who were involved in these activities they had lost employment yes because they uh, they required patronage which they got from kings uh, before and also the british manufactured goods replaced these ind indigenous industries right so a uh, major reason for loss of employment uh, and closure of indigenous industries there was high land revenue settlement and demands corrupt practices of administration that had caused uh, sale of lands to outsiders rampant corruption and bribery disposal of old zamindars and other landed est classes created a feeling of hatred towards british rule they were also lost by uh, faced by artisans and craftsmen due to loss of patronage so you see that every sector every community every occupational category of indians were suffering under the economic causes of the british rule yeah so everybody had reasons to hate the british rule 
and all this combined hatred had somewhere expressed in the revolt of 1857. Yes, there were also religious causes like dubious activities of Christian missionaries. Christian missionaries were not, um, uh, they, had, they had done major activities, they had a major presence in the Indian subcontinent, uh, but uh, it was not um, uh, liked by the Indians, the locals um, of, the, of those regions. The state patronage to a particular religion, this, of course, the British favored the Christianity over any religion that Indians were practicing. So that particular uh, patronage to their religion, the Catholic religion uh, that they would practice, was something that, again, Indians were not very, um, felt very good about. Legislations like abolition of sati, widow remarriage acts, they were seen as interference in religion. Yeah. So practice of sati with, uh, 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 and all of this was not something that um, was new to Indians. They were they were already practicing. Now I am not here supporting a, that they should, sati should shouldn't have been abolished or widow remarriage act shouldn't have been made. But then what I'm trying to emphasize is that the mind and heart of people who were already practicing these practices, social practices for over and over the years, Britishers had suddenly abolished them. So for people at that point of time, it was a huge shock. They thought that the Britishers are interfering in their culture and traditions and religion. And this angered them. Of course, we have benefited from abolition of Sati. Of course, we have benefited in the long run from Invidori marriage acts, you know. But at that point of time, people felt extremely angered because they thought it as an interference in their traditions and religions. Other causes like educated Indians were paid extremely low salaries. They were rampant unemployment and annexations due to subsidiary alliance system. I've already discussed this yesterday in my lecture. Resentment due to policy of doctrine of lapse, especially states like Satara, Jaipur, Sambalpur, Bhagat, Udaipur, Jhansi, Nagpur. These regions were brought under um, uh, the control of Britishers under the policy of doctrine of lapse because these uh, regions did not have natural air and they were not allowed to adopt heirs or adopt a successor. And Avad was taken over on the pretext of maladministration. Let's move further to understanding what was the nature of the revolt. So whether the, now there's a great discussion among scholars and historians about what this revolt was. Of course, everybody was angry with Britishers. They were all affected, gravely affected by the British policies. But uh, was this a, um, a revolt uh, because army was, uh, soldiers were the first ones to start? Was it just merely a sepoy mutiny? Or was it a national struggle? Or was it a manifestation of feudal reactions? So these are three uh, 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 characteristics that are given by uh, uh, historians according to the way they have perceived the nature of revolt of you know the 1857 british historians they have characterized the events of 1857 as sepoy mutiny sepoy mutiny means soldiers ne ek uh, bade level pe nahi, but unhone, uh, the sepoys, the soldiers um, uh, rose against the britishers uh, in some regions Civil rebellions were attributed to merely selfish interest of landholders and princes, right? So the British historians by and large consider it as a sepoy mutiny or jaha civil areas mein um, uh, rebellion ho rahe te, that was by and large uh, because of selfish interest of landholders, princes. So British did not treat 1857 as a big event. Big event. They, they thought that sepoy mutiny hui te, and civil areas may uh, hai rebellions hue, but then they were uh, for the little interest, selfish interests of landholders and princes. V.D. Savarkar's book, that was the Indian War of Independence of 1857, it characterized the events as a national war. Now, this was a phenomenal work, in fact, one of the first works on the 1857. And this made people think. Uh, and analyze 1857 as a big event, as a national war. Again, there are a lot of uh, opinions about it, about uh, agreements and disagreements, but V.D. We, we Savarkar's book uh, saw it as the first war of independence, 1857 revolt. The contemporary historians had challenged the use of term national. Rebels wanted to bring back the old system. Educated Indian participation was absent. 
revolt did not affect the entire country and was restricted to some ilakas so uh, studies that have happened in the about the 20th and the 21st century have challenged the use of word national because the sense of nation had still not emerged then moreover this revolt had not encompassed the entire indian subcontinent pure indian subcontinent mein ye iska failav nahi hua hum dekhenge course of revolt ki jab hum baat karenge that beyond narmada the revolt had not expanded it was in only few regions of north india that the revolt had uh, really happened right educated indian participation was absent and moreover the uh, the rebellions or the uh, revolt the people who were revolting they wanted to bring back the old system they wanted to bring back the mughal and mughal rule they wanted to bring back the feudal lords so in a lot of ways contemporary historians who have written about 1857 they do not consider this as a national rebellion at all right so let's see understand the course of revolt in 1857 may 11th meerut mutineers crossed delhi they appealed to bahadur shah to to proclaim himself as the shahanshah of hindustan by the first week of june mutinies broke out in aligarh manpuri bulandshehar etawa mathura lucknow bareilly jhansi etc by mid june and september 1857 it moved to gwalior bihar jabalpur by september and october the revolt moved further but it did not spill across narmada so you can really see that the revolt was restricted to only some areas of north india there were also role of rumors panic that has that had acted as springboards of action patterns so uh, for example people who were revolting they they there was a there was a rumor that up to british rule ant ho raha hai iska so there was there was this acted as catalyst this acted as springboard of more action there was also panic that hamara land ja raha hai so there was a lot of uh, reactions um, and knee jerk reactions that were happening because of the rumors and panic at, uh, panics that uh, acted as a panic that acted as springboard of actions the patterns of mutinies was destruction of houses used or lived in by british and government treasures and jails so what was attacked in terms of the physical manifestation of attack of by these rebellions um, were uh, uh, british um, uh, government offices treasures uh, treasuries jails you know houses of britishers so these were um, uh, uh, places that were attacked uh, by the mut uh, the mutineers or you know the rebellion rebels chapatis were passed from village to village so this is an interesting study of how uh, roti jo hai usko ek village se dusre village uh, pass logo ne pass kiya this was the way in the way people forwarded the movement from one place to another the rebellion and of course this has a different meaning for different people uh, people at several places organized get togethers to attack they did not hesitate to destroy economic resources for example the coal mines of kota were damaged there were also organizational effects of rebels like uh, like a letter was sent to rulers of all states of present day rajasthan soliciting their support in delhi a court of administrators was set up from avad the support came in the way that bridges qadar the uh, the the nawab of uh, the nizam uh, uh, the nawab of avad uh, successor bridges qadar was just a minor he was crowned by consensus so even at uh, organizational level at formally there was support, some kind of support that the revolt of 1857 had from various sectors there were also isolated outbreaks in peshawar singapore kolhapur chittagong and madras but they were easily put to ease by the britishers they could they could the britishers asani se usko rok sake in rebellions ko jo isolated outbreaks peshawar singapore kolhapur chittagong and madras mein hue however there are there is a reference that there were about 39000 troops that was shipped from london on request from london to aid suppression operation in india so there were a, a huge amount of troops that were needed by the britishers to suppress these rebellions in various places of north india right so prominent leaders we know of during 1857 revolt we've been studying them since we we've been uh, studied them since the, our school textbooks have introduced us to them like rani rakit of jhansi nana saheb kuwar singh of bihar begum hazrat mahal maulvi ahmedullah tantia tolbe so these were prominent leaders of the 1857 revolt 
So uh, now let's look at what was the significance of this revolt. Revolt happened. We know how the revolt happened. What was the course of the revolt? Why did the revolt happen? But what was its significance? Because we know that no, in no way we can say that it was a national um, uh, phenomenon. Hmm? So the significance was that by this time now, the company realized that it had to take control of the Indian territory directly. There was end of company rule and beginning of direct British rule. All feudal class were reinstated to their position in order to gain their loyalty and support for the British rule. Annexationist policy towards native state was given up. Annexationist policy, I mean, uh, through doctrine of lapse and subsidiary alliance. That, that was now given up. Theoretically, Indians were now subject to British crown. That means the British queen, hai, British crown, hai, uske under ab Indians are gaye hai, India are gaya hai, direct control. And therefore, entitled to royal proclamation. That means, jobi orders of India pe lagu honge, whatever orders will be uh, applied on India will come directly from the Queen's proclamation, from the British crown. Army was completely reorganized. They understood that army may they can't have Indian soldiers in important positions. Artillery section was taken under, uh, the, they had completely taken over the artillery, the English would take control completely, English soldiers would take control of artillery section. So army was really reorganized in a major way. Strategic departments across the administration were kept under British troops exclusively. Yes. Uh, another important feature uh, of the 1857 uh, revolt, uh, which was quite significant, was the growth of social distance between Hindu and Muslims that eventually led to communalization of social life. Eventual partici partition of India that we saw, policy of divide and rule was now initiated by the Britishers. So these were these were broad, uh, you know, characteristics, features, and significance of the revolt of 1857. Now again, you have an entire unit on the discussion of 1857 in your e-learning resource. So I would really encourage you to please go back to the original resource and uh, uh, refer to that, and uh, you know, get more understanding from the um, from your reference. Let's move to the land revenue settlement now. Uh, as I told you that agriculture was the major uh, sector from which revenue had to be taken, had to, was uh, revenue had to come to the British Treasury. Britishers could not function um, or could not expand their colonial rule, consolidate their colonial rule or for that matter rule in, in India in any way without revenue. And the revenue would not come from Britain. Britain is sponsor kar rahe British rule in India. Mein. Indians hi apna rule sponsor kar rahe. British rule sponsor kar rahe hain. Wohi interesting baat hai. Ki ye jo land se revenue aa raha hai, usko hi nichod nichod kar Britishers apne aap ko yahan pe establish kar rahe Right? So, uh, when the Britishers came to India, and I've discussed this uh, in my previous lecture, 18th century, 1757 onwards, when they started getting control over land through Diwani rights over Bengal and then later in other regions, uh, when they came to Bengal, you know, they, they really initially did not bother to change any system. From 1772 in Bengal, uh, 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 after, after some time in 1772 in Bengal, they introduced the farming system. Now, what is this farming system? Where the farming system is where the contract to collect land revenue was given to the highest bidder. What does this mean? That means that Joe Insan, ya yeah, Joe um, contractor, Britishers ko promise karega, promise karega ki main aapko itna land revenue lake dunga. Jo maximum land revenue lake dega, usi contractor ko contract diya jayega us particular land. Farming system, where the contract to collect revenue was given to the highest bidder. The contractor resorted to all sorts of unfair, corrupt, and violent means to collect land revenue. So initially, um, after assuming power, East India Company continued with the system of Nawab, land revenue administration in Bengal, but that eventually led to corruption by companies' employees only. They did try to introduce the farming system and all, but Cornwallis was then sent to India from England to clean up and reorganize the administration, you know, because there was there were systems of collection of land revenue, 
but they were very very exploitative in nature and britishers were not getting anything out of it revenue aa raha tha but british ke haath mein nahi aa raha tha and that was troubling britishers so the con lord conwallis was sent to india to clean up and reorganize administration as uh, according to britishers they were it was it, the existing system was leading to impoverishment of the country and agriculture was in decline so on this pretext conwallis was sent to india but we know that uh, uh, after 1786 the settlements that were made were made not to favor or elevate the condition of the peasantry but it was to maximize the colonial um, the revenue for colonial rule by the britishers so let's understand what this permanent settlement system was that was introduced in bengal there were about 3 to 4 million cultivating families in bihar bengal and odisha which was the bengal presidency so again let me get, get back to you on one point that i have already discussed yesterday that when i say bengal i don't mean the west bengal of today or the calcutta of today what i mean is the entire region of bengal bihar and odisha which was under the bengal presidency now here according to the permanent settlement system uh, the settlement was made directly directly settling and collecting revenue from them would take many years right and it would cost large sums to the government and leave ample scope of corruption uh, so uh, what happened was hence it was decided to collect revenue from a group of zamindars who had traditionally performed the role and this was introduced by lord cornwallis so what was done was the settlement was made with the zamindars of the villages right and um, uh, the zamindars who were powerful zamindars of many villages or some villages or a particular villages or a land and villages so the settlement was made with the zamindar of the uh, to collect revenue uh, so zamindar would be the uh, would be the intermediary between the peasant and the british he was working as a british official who would collect revenue from the peasant and give to the britishers so basically the zamindars were made proprietors of the land when i say proprietors i mean owners of the land they could sell mortgage or transfer it if zamindar did not pay tax on time then his zamindari was put on sale or auction and the new owner would have the rights so although zamindar was given a lot of power he was made the owner of the land उसको परमिशन दी गई कि आप अपने लैंड को सेल कर सकते हो मॉर्डगेज कर सकते हो ट्रांसफर कर सकते हो तो जमींदार इन वे वॉज क्वाइट एम्पावर्ड इट वॉज क्वाइट गिवन क्वाइट अ नंबर ऑफ राइट्स बट इफ ही फेल्ड टू गिव रेवेन्यू सर्टन असाइन रेवेन्यू दैट ही हैड टू सेंड टू द ब्रिटिश द परमानेंट रेवेन्यू दैट वॉज फिक्स ऑन जमींदार यू नो एरिया दैट हैड टू बी सेंड टू द ब्रिटिशर्स इफ ही फेल टू डू दैट द जमींदार his zamindari or his land was taken from him and it was put on sale so we will see that how many zamindars had lost their zamindari rights yeah so one of the major uh, uh, impact on the position of cultivators because of the uh, permanent settlement system were that they were reduced to the status of tenants of the zamindars because the zamindar was made the owner of the land so basically the person who was tilling the land the peasant was no more owning his own land he was made in fact the tenant and the land was now with the zamindar so those zamindars were to issue pattas to the tenants they never did and that patta was that ye ye krishi ya ye peasant itna tax permanently uh, zamindar ko dega ye patta uh, uh, zamindar ko peasants ko issue karna tha tenants ko issue karna tha but he never did that if tenants did not pay rent on time zamindar could seize tenants property so zamindar ke paas uska land uh, tenant ke paas uska ya tenant ke paas uska land to tha hi nahi on top of it jo uski property thi that was also now uh, taken if he was not able to pay tax to the zamindar the zamindar further resorted to illegal methods and this worsened the condition of the actual cultivator All right now the effect of the permanent settlement system was also on many zamindars many zamindars could not pay uh, the revenue on time leading to loss of their zamindaris i've already discussed this point 
large scale transfer of land from old zamindars to the moneyed class of the cities which were the new zamindars who had uh, no interest in their estates these new zamindars uh, sublet their zamindari giving rise to a class of intermediaries so jab zamindar nahi de pata tha revenue time pe to dusre koi naye zamindar ko ne jo offer kiya ki hum aapko britishers ko hum zyada revenue denge usko diya de diya gaya ab ye jo naye zamindar the ye ye gaon mein nahi rehte the they did not live in the villages they were living in cities so they were remote controlling their Uh, 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 their orders in the village. That means that they were moneyed class, but they had no interest in their land in the in the in the in in, in the village. They had just take uh, taken the right to pay revenue, uh, collecting it from the peasants, but they really did not have any interest in the land in the which was there as a part of the zamindari in the village. Right? Agriculture became stagnant since there was nothing left to reinvest in the land. no scope for increase in taxation so therefore in the long run britishers realized the east india company realized that these uh, that it could it it was not a profitable venture agriculture was no more a profitable venture because revenue the amount of revenue that the britishers wanted from the land of course that was unreasonable because it was very high the land was not that uh, could not produce that much because land mein utna invest hi nahi kiya gaya पेजेंट जितना उसको जोत के निकाल रहा था वहां से उतना उसको मिल रहा था राइट सो देर वॉज नो स्कोप फॉर इंक्रीज इन टैक्सेशन दैट ब्रिटिश कुड डू सो इन द लॉन्ग रन इट बिकेम लेस प्रॉफिटेबल टू द ई आई सी इन इंग्लिश ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी सिंस टैक्सेस कुड नॉट बी इंक्रीज एज दे वर फिक्सड इन परपेचुएटी परमानेंट सेटलमेंट सिस्टम में टैक्स जो है वो परमानेंट लेवल पे एक परमानेंट टैक्स फिक्स कर दिया गया था उसके बियॉन्ड ब्रिटिशर्स अलाउड नहीं थे करना फिक्स्ड इन परपेचुएटी था वो तो बेसिकली दे वर नॉट गेनिंग फ्रॉम दिस परमानेंट सेटलमेंट सिस्टम ब्रिटिश ऑफिशियल्स सून बिगैन टू डाउट द वर्चुअल्स ऑफ दिस सिस्टम एज इट्स डिफेक्ट्स बिकेम मोर प्रोमिनेंट बाय 1811 लंदन अथॉरिटीज वॉन्ड अगेंस्ट इंट्रोडक्शन ऑफ दिस सिस्टम right so this was uh, about the permanent settlement system let me go through rayatwari and mahalwari system briefly i take the next 5 to 7 minutes and then i'll end my lecture on on this particular block uh, rayatwari system was introduced by munro and reed in 1792 in madras and bombay presidencies based on the minute and detailed survey of land matlab ki ek survey karne ke baad ek tax उस पर्टिकुलर रीजन से असेस जितना होगा वो कर वो जरूरत थी इस पर्टिकुलर सिस्टम में रायत वाली सिस्टम में विच वॉज बेस्ड ऑन मिनट एंड डिटेल सर्वे ऑफ लैंड सेटलमेंट वॉज मेड डायरेक्टली विद द रैयत नाउ द रैयत मीन्स प्रेजेंट जो कृषि है जो लैंड को जोत रहा है प्रोड्यूस कर रहा है जो टिल कर रहा है रैयत द प्रेजेंट उसके साथ ही सेटलमेंट किया गया जैसे परमानेंट सेटलमेंट सिस्टम जमींदार के साथ किया गया था सेटलमेंट वॉज मेड बिटवीन द जमींदार एंड द ब्रिटिश now this is between rayat it was directly made uh, with the rayat or the peasant the early rayatwari system was a field assessment which meant tax payable on each field was fixed and then the cultivator had the choice of cultivating the field and paying that amount or not cultivating it however the working of the system was quite different later on was difference in the theory and practice of the system so again i'm uh, there's a lot that i want to discuss on rayatwari system uh, it's given in detail that how it changed also the characteristic the nature the feature of rayatwari system it changed over a period of time and how it was very different like the way britishers wanted it in theory that it should be applied and how in practice practical implementation jab uska hua to wo us theory se bilkul match nahi karta tha so actually for example detailed survey was never undertaken and therefore most of the assessment was based on past assessments jo pehle assessments ho rahi thi usi ke basis pe naye assessments uh, revenue assessments banaye gaye the put cut system which was the last method of uh, assessment revenue rates were to be periodically revised and they were fixed at a very high rate the reform rayatwari system developed in bombay after 1836 and madras after 1858 burden of and revenue was uh, somewhat reduced and uh, burden of taxes and revenue was somewhat reduced in the new reform system rayatwari system that was brought about in 1836 and 58 and land acquired a saleable value there were also later major rural uprisings because of all of these settlement systems in the region uh, in 1875 
so in 1875 we saw uh, i think in my previous lectures also i have spoken about the peasant rebellions that happened uh, in about the last 25 years of 19th century last a few decades of the 19th century major tribal and peasant uprising happened so all of this one of the major reason was the land revenue assessment system that was introduced by the britishers across india right now the mahalmari system which was introduced in north india and north western part of india it was a settlement which was made taking village as a fiscal unit well when i say village as a fiscal unit i mean village as a fiscal unit was called mahal revenue was collected directly from village headman who was the mukaddam or the pradhan revenue was to be fixed after a detailed survey which was never done and um, therefore revenue demand was extremely high so uh, what uh, these officials were supposed to do was they were supposed to do a survey of the land which they never did and on the basis of the survey of land they would fix a revenue or they would decide a revenue which of course the, the was um uh, were not fixed it it had to be it had to be revised over a period of time but they never conducted the survey at the first place so land was the the revenue was um, the was uh, made on the basis of previous assessments right so therefore the and uh, it, the revenue rates were very very high they were extreme the demand was extremely high the result of this was that the large areas of land began to be passed into the hands of money lenders and merchants all of this the permanent settlement system the rayatwari system or the mahalwari system had brought great impoverishment and widespread dispossession of land of cultivators so basically now the land was not with the tiller the land was not with the peasant the land now was with the not with the cultivator but with the money lender with the zamindar with the new zamindars with other intermediaries so these became the land holders land owners and the peasant had lost his land and this was a tragedy that in uh, the that uh, happened uh, to indian peasants during the colonial period yes so i'll um, end my presentation here i think i've uh, spoken enough about the three broad themes that we have discussed today and uh, i think uh, thank you so much for your uh, patience uh, all of you uh, and for my for hearing out hearing me out and uh, i would uh, now hand it over to dr shaheen for her comments and if there are any questions then i will take them up thank you so much thank you so much ma'am uh, for explaining every topic uh, beautifully and uh, now i am requesting actually uh, yes now i am requesting uh, students if they have any questions please uh, you can write in the chat box or you can ask the your question directly to our ma'am mr vivekananda acharya do you have any questions mr vivekananda acharya uh, i think he did not have any question okay so lastly i would like to say that uh, yes uh, so all this unit uh, whatever we discuss and uh, we will see that uh, that how that uh, three major land system that uh, devised by the british that uh, those came into existence and then when these new areas came under british rule the settlements made uh, resembled either the rayatwari or the mahalwari and the punjab came under the mahalwari and uh, as did a large part of central india under a slightly modified from uh, known as uh, malguzari so in avad after the revolt of 1857 the government recognized the talukdar as proprietor and uh, so as to ensure that they supported uh, it in any future revolt and uh, the assessment itself was mahalwari so in ever present theme throughout uh, discussion that uh, the drive to collect large revenue was uh, center to british policy and sometimes this led to the development of a land market to the sale and purchase of land but at that but at other times the state's demands were so heavy and no purchasers were to be found 
so the need to collect so much was itself was necessary by the heavy expenditure of the government in india and uh, of course and its need to send large sums to britain for its expense there and um, lastly i would like to say professor mishra if you have any comment yes one student is saying something purna maharana yes do you have any question hello hello maharana do you have any question i think they can write their question on the chat uh, chat box uh, yes ma'am in the chat box also they don't have but they any might question. be they not, not write any yes ma'am okay lastly i would like to say professor mishra sir if you have any comment or lastly if you want to say anything exactly. please uh, today's topic was really very interesting and this is there was very in an excellent way has delineated uh, different aspects of this topic within the short span of one and one and half hour things that agent 57 is suggesting that it has been embedded in the memory of indians and it will be there people may forget about the land revenue settlement and all those things but taking 57 is such an event forget about the semantic problem whether it is a time meeting whether it was a first war of independence but we as indians remember very fondly about 1857 and you can say that real indian nationalism began after 1857 so the first war of independence there has been given the title by savarkar's book we will go on forever in the memory of indians and we are thankful to mr deo for giving a lecture on the topic and again we will see our tomorrow yes so thank you very much everybody sign this is deo mr rudra pratap das and the learners thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you so much namaskar thank you thank you ma'am thank you thank you rudra for your technical support thank thank you thank you madam okay okay bye, bye.